If you have your Bibles, take them and turn to Luke 14. Luke 14, now we've got a small section that we'll actually be focusing in on, but you need to see where all this comes together. So let's look at Luke chapter 14, starting in verse 1. Now it happened as Jesus went to the house of one of the rulers of the Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath, that they watched him closely. In verse 2, and behold, there was a certain man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus answered, spoke, uh, spoke to the lawyers and Pharisees saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? But they kept silent and he took him and he healed him and he let him go. Then he answered them saying, which of you having a donkey or an ox that has fallen into a pit will not immediately pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him regarding these things. So he told a parable to those who were invited when he noted how they chose the best places, saying to them, when you're invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him. And he who invited you and him come and say to you, give place to this man. And then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you're invited, go and sit down in the lowest place so that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, go up to the higher. Then you will have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. And right here... <coughs> In verse 12, it starts our passage. Then Jesus also said to him who invited him, When you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask your friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind. And you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Let's pray. (coughs) Father, I thank you for the time to come and open up your word. I ask that you would just empower me, uh, your people to hear. Father, that we understand these concepts and they're just lived out as kingdom citizens. And Father, for those that aren't a part of the kingdom this morning, I pray that the call of your Holy Spirit be so loud, it be deafening. Father, that they would have to respond rather than deal with the consistent conviction that comes across with it. Father, thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for blessing us in this place with your people. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus gave us a command. He gave us a command. He said, you and me are to say this. This is Luke 17.10, if you wouldn't mind saying this with me. We are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. I remember hearing a story about a prominent Bible teacher a prominent Bible teacher who was well-respected as a godly man. He was once walking down the street with his student, and as they were walking down the street, a lovely young lady came walking past. She was very attractive, and the student followed her as she started to the point where she left. By the time he got through Staring, he noticed that the professor was watching him the entire time. Apologetically, he turned back to the professor. He said, I am so sorry, professor, who was then in his 70s. He said, I am so sorry. I can't wait till I'm old enough where that stuff doesn't bother me anymore. And the professor looked at him and he said, me too. Godliness doesn't mean that you've somehow arrived and you sin no more, but that you're attempting to faithfully walk with Jesus on a daily basis. Listen to what the uh, 
Apostle Paul wrote to his protege Titus in Titus 2, 11 through 14. It says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. There's a word for today. Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. And we are to be a godly people demonstrating godliness. As we go through the sermon today, I want you to ask yourself this question. Am I striving to live a godly life? Am I striving to live a godly life? In other words, am I demonstrating the character that Jesus expects? Luke recorded these accounts in the life of Jesus to demonstrate the irrefutable characteristics of a life that's lived for the Lord. I want to stop here and I want you to put something in your heart and your mind before we go any further because there's something you really, really need to understand, especially as we go through these passages. Today in this world, there are people that can live in mercy and humility and generosity and willingness, but their motives can be wrong. The intent of their heart can be wrong. They can be people that don't know the Lord. It's... (laughs) It's apparent. You've been around people that are lost, don't care anything about Jesus Christ. They don't want to live for Him, and they're some of the most humble people that you will ever meet. We've all come across these types of people. Folks, the characteristics that we talk, we're talking about today show up in the life of a Christian. That doesn't mean that they can't be faked in the world today. Does that make sense? We're just saying this is an identifying characteristic. It's not, here's the point, it's not what saves a person. Repentance from sin and faith and trust in Jesus Christ alone is the thing that saves you. These are characteristics. So don't walk away from here going, huh. I'm just going to do it. I'm going to start living a life of generosity. I'm going to be merciful. And this is going to get me into the kingdom of God. This is going to get me into heaven. Because it will not. Hypocrisy, pretending, acting does not get you in. This is the byproduct of a life lived for the Lord. That's why we're talking about demonstrating godliness. So far... We've covered two points in Luke 14, and we need to review. First, we saw how godly people demonstrate mercy. If you read through the scriptures, there are passages that just fly off the page at you. In your private time, or maybe if we're reading on Sunday morning and you pick it up, there are some things that stick out more than others. You'll be reading and you'll say, that right there, that applies to me. How is God speaking to me? Well, number one, folks, this is the voice of God. And so when you read it, he does speak to you. This is how he communicates with you best. So if you want to hear from him, what do you need to do? Read it. Sometimes you'll be reading about the miracles of Christ, and you're riveted to your seat, you, you, you're sitting there thinking to yourself, this is incredible, and it makes you glow because you understand that God is working in a way that only He can work. And then there are times where you get into a passage like we're going through today. And you're sitting there looking at it going, Jesus did what? How uncomfortable would that have made everybody in the room for Him to do that? How could He have... The nerve to stand in front of these people and actually do what he did. That's the way I feel reading this entire passage. Jesus had finished probably teaching that morning. He was on a Saturday, on a Sabbath, he had gone to synagogue. And, you know, if they knew Jesus was there, they'd just invite him to come up and preach. If Dr. John MacArthur showed up and he was sitting out in this 
congregation after you revived me with the AED in the foyer, I'd say there's no way I'm preaching. And I think that's probably what happened every time Jesus came as they were trying to invite him until that time got cut off and they didn't want to hear from him anymore. But he was invited. He teaches he ends up being invited to lunch and he goes over to the ruler of a Pharisee's house. And as he's in there, he sits down and he starts to watch everything that's going on. He sees the way that these guys are interacting with one another. And he realizes right then and there that he has been set up. Because there's a man with dropsy in there. Edema. He has swelling body parts. There's some kind of heart, lung problem. There's something going on in his life that needs to be fixed. He knew that it was wrong because the Pharisees didn't hang out with people like that. They were above everyone else. And they figured if somebody was that sick, then they must have committed some grievous sexual sin. They had something in their background, in their life, and God was cursing them. So they stayed as far away from them as possible. Those people were on the lowest rungs of society, didn't want to talk to them. But Jesus looked at that guy, and he saw them, He knew that they were trying to set him up. And he grabbed him and he healed him right there in front of everyone. And this is something I want you to get with all of these stories that we're reading through, all of the interactions. Jesus, being God, did what was right all the time, regardless of the social protocols. He did not care. They wanted to see Jesus heal this man so that they could call him on some man-made law that they had made up. And he said, no, 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 no. In this situation, the best thing for me to do is be merciful because this person is hurting. And there isn't a Christian in this room that should not react the same way. If you see someone hurting, you leave the humdrum every day way of doing things. If you see somebody that needs help, you give them that help. That's what Jesus did. He showed mercy. He demonstrated godliness because he is God and mercy is a characteristic that goes along with being a kingdom citizen. Immediately after Jesus healed the man, he launched into a parable. He explained that godly people demonstrate humility. So he moves from mercy demonstrating that to talking about humility. And you have to know he's talking about humility because these guys, the crowd, the people that had invited him, were not doing that. We're not doing the very thing that needed to be done for this man that needed help during that time. He started talking about the way that they came in and they clamored for seats. They vied for position. I told you about this last time. They had these tables and there were these little couches and three people could sit on each couch. And there was one seat of honor to the left and to the right of the host that would have been at the head of the table. And he would have brought the most distinguished guest up there and sat them down on the left and the right of him. These guys were pushing each other out of the way, trying to get in the best position possible. You see, they decreased in their importance as they went down the table. They would often repay each other by doing kind things for one another to gain a better position among their peers. There was no humility in what was going on. Jesus watched this and he called them out on it. Right there in front of them, he did something that would make the rest of us feel ashamed for what went on. The one way that he set it up that they would have listened to the most is he said, what if you've sat in the greatest seat of honor? And then there's a more distinguished guest that comes in. When you see that more distinguished guest come in, you're in trouble because the host is going to go down, he's going to grab this guest of honor, and he's going to take him up to the best place, and you're going to have to move down the lowest place, and you're going to be shamed. For us, Yeah, it would be embarrassing, but for them, in a shame, honor culture, it was enormous. And they did not want to go through that. Jesus did this 
because he wanted them to see their lack of humility. He wasn't saying if you just simply act like you're humble, then you'll get into the kingdom because they performed that kind of characteristic all the time in front of the public. But a man that's humble before God will be humble before people. That's what he wanted them to get. He wanted them to really understand that God's people live lives of humility. They don't seek recognition and are constantly trying to do one thing. They're constantly trying to put other people before them. Those accounts make it clear that godly people demonstrate mercy and humility. And this morning we're going to cover another characteristic of godliness in this series. In verses... 12 through 14, Jesus shows us that godly people demonstrate generosity. They demonstrate generosity. As tense as the situation already was, Jesus made things worse. In verse 12, when he turned his attention on to the host, he said, When you give a dinner or a supper, do not ask friends, your brothers, your relatives, nor rich neighbors, lest they also invite you back. And you be repaid. Folks, he just identified every person there. He just pointed to each one of them and told the host, don't invite these people. (laughs) That would have been funny to be sitting there when all of that happened. Jesus had already dishonored the guest at the dinner party. So not wanting to give anyone a pass, he engaged the ruler of the Pharisees. Speaking directly to him, he told him who not to invite. He told him not to invite his friends, his brothers, his relatives, or rich neighbors. But you have to ask yourself why that was, why he told them that. It was because when you invited someone over to your house, the favor had to be returned. They did nothing just... For kindness, they did nothing just because somebody needs something. They always expected to receive something in return. Something greater in return. The Jews traded favor like currency. Repeat that. The Jews traded favor like currency. In other words, they did something for you when you were obligated to do something for them in return. Here's the concept that you need to get. Kingdom citizens don't trade favors. There has to be, in this room, toes that are being stepped on with this one. Kingdom citizens do not trade favors. They serve Christ understanding that their reward is going to be in glory with them. I believe without thinking about it, many Christians missed the boat on this one. In the past, I have had, and this doesn't have to be you, I've had Sunday school teachers and church workers come up to me, especially this time of year, because you know what's about to happen. Got a nominating committee about to start looking for people to teach our young ones, and they'll come up to me and they'll say this. Say, Pastor... I'll teach this one year, but don't you ever ask me this again. I'm going to do it this one time. I'm going to do you a favor, and I'm going to teach, but don't you ever ask me to do this again. Folks, they're attempting to barter with me in that scenario. Do you know what they're trying to barter? You know what they're attempting to tell me during that time? They want to trade their involvement for irresponsibility later on. You can't say amen, you don't say oh me. You know, they don't want to be tied down for one hour on Sunday morning. I mean, that's too much to give. They don't want to give generously unto the Lord, unto Christ, because they've got better things to do with their time, such as drink that extra cup of coffee or read the morning paper. They treat it like a jail sentence that we have asked for that one hour, and it doesn't have to be just 
Sunday school workers. It could be any position in this church that you were asked to do. And you say, Pastor, how dare you get into the pulpit and start talking about these things that are unconscionable. I can't handle this. How dare you do that? Folks, we've got workers all over this place in every church, in every denomination that do exactly the same thing. People haven't changed since the days of Jesus. They can't give that hour. And you know what? I'm going to take up for them. I'm going to do it. I'm going to take up for them because that hour is their precious hour. It really is. I mean, seriously, they can't give up that hour because they've got to go play Pokemon around town. I mean, they've got to. I mean, in order of priorities, that just makes sense. People getting hit by cars because they're playing Pokemon rather than serving the Lord. Amen? Amen. What happened to giving to the Lord with a cheerful heart? Church, let's be clear on something. When you give of your time and your strength and your money, this is one that I've got to make clear to you. You're not giving it to me. You're not giving it to Miss Kate. You're not giving it to our church leaders here. When you give of those things, you're giving those things unto the Lord. They're His. Don't come back to me later on and say, well, I did my part. I'm done now. Well, that's right. You probably did it for yourself or tried to do it with me to gain favor and be done with it later on. But folks, if you've done it for the Lord, it's eternal and it will keep carrying on and you'll have a joyful heart in the midst of it. Your life is the Lord's. And the only one that you owe anything to It's Him. If you're a Christian, then you've given your life to Him. You owe Him everything. And you serve Him out of love, not out of obligation. I'm not trying to clear y'all out for next week. I'm just telling you the way I feel about it and what I see. I don't want you to think that Being stingy or selfish only happens when the church gathers together. People can be that way anywhere. There will always be people who do something for someone else expecting something in return. If I'm going to do this, then I need something coming my way. If I'm going to do this, then you better do this on my behalf. We have people that will butter people up to get what they want. You'll say, I'll go over and I'll cut that grass over there because later on I'm going to want them to be nice to me. This is what you're thinking in the back of your mind. I'm going to bake that cake. I'm going to take it to this person so that later on when the time comes, they're going to be nice to me. I'm going to be nice to my neighbors so that later on they will just simply return this. Folks, you will turn the other cheek. You will be kind if you're a Christian simply because it's in your new nature to do so, not because you expect anything in return. Some people don't understand this concept. They're like... Pastor, how am I supposed to get things done if I don't trade favors like this? And I'm speaking on a very fundamental level. Some of you I'm talking to, you get it. You're like, how am I, how am I going to get things done if I don't trade these favors? Well, folks, that's not how a kingdom citizen operates. I understand that all my needs are supplied in Christ Jesus and He will give me everything that's coming my way that I'll need for the task that's at hand. I don't need you. I don't need somebody else. I need him to supply everything that I need. The problem is, is a lot of people don't trust the Lord. You say, what's my problem? You don't trust the Lord. You say, well, I can trust the Lord. Are you asking the Lord? Man, I've seen some incredible things happen in the past couple weeks. I've seen some enormous blessings because I have sat down, I have been praying, I've asked for this from the congregation, 
And I thank you for those that have allowed me to do it, but I've been prayer walking Hinesville. And I've run into individuals that needed to hear the gospel. I've run into people that just needed prayer. I mean, God is doing some great things through that service. But folks, if you want the same thing to be happening in your life, you need to trust God, ask Him for it, and understand He'll supply what you need. You're a child of the King, so go to Him and ask for your needs. Life, living a life of generosity is how God takes care of the needs of his people. Do you remember what Jesus said back in Luke chapter 6 verse 38? He says, give and it will be given to you. Let's stop there. That pretty much covers the whole thing. Give and it will be given to you. Give and it will be given to you. Do you hear me? Give and it will be given to you. This is the concept that our Lord gives to you. He tells us they will pour into your lap a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, for by your standard of measure it will be measured to you in return. As long as we're seeking to serve Christ in His kingdom, we'll have every supply we'll ever need. But folks, you've got to be serving Him, not the people around you. Amen? Also, I guess I need to clarify something before we go any further. In this illustration, Jesus is not telling us that we shouldn't have family and friends over to fellowship or to have parties. Well, first off, he was invited to somebody's house and he just went over. Okay? If you go back and you look where he was invited in chapter 5 by Levi the tax collector, he went back over to Levi's house and there was a great party that took place. A fellowship Baptist, in case you were confused. that There was a fellowship that took place. He went in there and enjoyed his time with friends of the faith, people that were coming to know the Lord. And if you think about it like this, Jesus, around the age of 30, starts his ministry. He had been going to Passover every single year. His parents kept the law. When they got together on Passover, it was an enormous festival time. People from all over, thousands, millions of people came together to celebrate Passover. Jesus knew what it was to have a good time. That's not what he's talking about here. Jesus just wanted you to know that when you give someone something, you shouldn't expect anything in return to them. Does that make sense? You shouldn't expect to have to return anything. You receive the word from him. He teaches you what you need to know. And folks, your reward is going to come in heaven. That's when God's going to reward you. God's people demonstrate generosity because it's a reflection of who they are in Christ. So instead of attempting to earn temporary earthly admiration, Jesus said this to the Pharisee. In verse 13 and 14, he said, But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Exploiting the hospitality of each other was getting the Jews nowhere. Their self-serving glory was only elevating them in their own eyes and the eyes of their peers, not in God's eyes. So Jesus offered the host a solution. He told him to invite the poor. And we're going to go through these really quickly. He said, invite the poor, those who literally had nothing to barter with. They could not give anything in return. He said, invite the poor. He went on there and said, invite the maimed, individuals who were injured doing something and they couldn't return. He said, invite the lame, those who couldn't walk. He said, invite the blind, those who couldn't see. Remember, all these people were social pariahs. They had looked at them and said, they've committed a sin. We're staying away. We don't want to be anywhere near them. Why did Jesus invite those people? Why did he tell the host to invite those people? He told the host to invite those people because the host couldn't be repaid if he had invited them to come out. That was the primary reason right there. But if you think about it, Think about it. If it's a lame person, a blind person, 
a main person, what are you going to have to do to have them at your dinner party? you got to go get them. <laughs> He's saying, not only do I want you to invite these people, I want you to go get them. Do you think that Jesus was trying to communicate something to us as Christians today? Folks, we can't sit in here and just invite them. <laughs> we got to go get them. We got to go get them. We got to get out there and we got to talk to people. Yesterday, as we saw cars passing by, we invited them inside. There was literature out for the church. Brother Bob was doing an experiment with our uh, disaster relief, and people were invited, and they're bringing these people together that they might share the gospel with them. Folks, we've got to go out, and we've got to bring them back in. We can't just sit here with our candle lit and the door shut and expect somebody to see it. Because it doesn't work like that. You know, as I was going through this, I was thinking, this is very similar what he's describing here in modern day parlance to a church van ministry. I know that this church has had one before. I, I did one in the past myself. Don't, I'm not looking at anybody. Do you know why? Do you know why this is usually shut down? Somebody at some point says, we can't afford to do this anymore. And it seems justified in their eyes when they do that. And really what it boils down to is you say our money is more important than the gospel. I'm sure there were other reasons. Bring all your complaints to Brother Samuel after the service. <laughs> God's people demonstrate generosity, understanding that the Lord himself will replenish their supplies, whatever that is. Material, spiritual, physical, he'll replenish you. You have to know that he's going to take care of it. If you give, he's going to give back to you. Or do you not think that the Lord has enough to go around? The Jewish people as a whole, were short-sighted. They lived under a selfish, legalistic system, which they believed was earning them an eternal reward, but they were wrong. That's why Jesus attempted to correct them by saying that they would be blessed. This is what he says in the passage, that they would be blessed or repaid at the resurrection of the just. They didn't need to impress each other. They just needed to live generously as God had blessed them. At this point, I need to tell you, that I have partially misunderstood the resurrection of the just in the past. I grouped it with the rapture, but that is incomplete at best. There's a specific sequence given in Scripture when it comes to resurrections. Are you interested in resurrections? Would you like to know more about that? I hope so, because the rest of the service is going to deal with resurrections. Many, however, have been confused because Jesus spoke of the resurrection in general. He spoke of them in generality on a couple of occasions. For instance, in John chapter 5, 28 and 29, look closely at what it says. Jesus commented on the power of God to raise people from the dead, and he said this, Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth. Those who did good deeds to a resurrection of life. Those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. Again, Jesus was talking about two basic types of resurrections in that passage. He wasn't giving a sequence of events. When I've read this in the past, I've seen it as a sequence of events. That's not what's going on here. He wasn't saying that they would happen at the same time. He just wanted the Jews to understand that he had the power to bring everyone who's ever existed back to life. He holds life in his hands. He holds the power to raise the dead. That's what he wanted to get across to these people. By the way, the resurrection of life, which is talked about here, is 
eternal life. John 17, 3, you can look at it yourself. It's the only time where Jesus is really talking about justifying people in Christ Jesus. Therefore, it's also called the resurrection of the just. So the resurrection of life or the resurrection of just is the same thing. The resurrection of life is the same thing as the resurrection of the just. You need to keep those in mind as we go forward. Now, even though Jesus didn't tell us what order the resurrections would happen in, fortunately, the Apostle Paul did. He told us exactly what the order was going to be. Man, man, oh man, I hope you enjoy this as much as I did when I was studying it. 1 Corinthians 15, 22 through 24 gives you the order of resurrections and how they'll happen. He gives you a sequence of resurrections. More than just the rapture, there are other resurrections that will take place. Let me repeat this. There are other times where people will, according to the Greek, stand up on two feet from the dead. And he lists them right here. I mean, this is incredible. Look at what it says. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. Is that a few? Get it in your head. That's everyone, right? Covers everyone. In verse 23. But each in his own what? You see it, right? But each in his own order. Christ the first fruits. After that, those who are Christ at his coming... And then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. From the get-go, Paul makes it clear that anyone who has ever been created by God will die. Everyone that's ever been created by God will die. And if you happen to be a Bible scholar and you want to debate the whole Enoch, Elijah thing, I'd love to stand toe-to-toe with you after the service on that one. But one thing's certain. Everyone who's ever been born will die. Our Savior even fell into that category. But that doesn't mean that we're finished once we stop breathing. Paul told us once again in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that all will be made alive. In the future, several resurrections are going to take place where the just and the unjust will meet the judge of the universe, which is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. There are three resurrections mentioned in Scripture, and I believe we need to start with the most important one. First, let's talk about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I hope y'all love this. I absolutely love this. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul said that the resurrection of Jesus was the first fruits of what was to come. He was the beginning of all resurrections in the future. Let me explain what he was talking about by first fruits. Farmers, farmer background. You'll probably hold on to this one a little bit quicker. When the harvest came in, the Israelites would go out into the fields and they would get the finest of the crop. They would get that first fruits, a sample of the best that was to come. And here's what they would do. Oh, this is so good. They would walk in to the priest and they would hand it to the priest. And they said, this is the first fruits of our harvest. Now the thing was, is they couldn't go and get the rest of their harvest until they brought the first fruits into the priests. So what Paul is telling us in this passage is Jesus was the first fruits of what is to come. Do you remember the first life that was resurrected from the dead? Now you see, Pastor, I could go back in the Old Testament. There were all kinds of people that were... No, 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 no. They were raised to life, which means that they died again. Jesus was resurrected with a glorified body, and he was the first fruits of what was to come. So how does all this fit together? Here's what he's telling us. Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection. So he's saying that Jesus arose from the grave. He was the first one to show up. And if that hadn't been presented before the Father, then the rest of the harvest couldn't be brought in. 
That's just good. I don't care who you are. Jesus had to arise because if he didn't arise, then no one could. History and scripture are so good. Second, Paul talks about the resurrection of the just, referring to them, listen to this, this is going back to 1 Corinthians 15 that we read, referring to those who are Christ's at his coming. Now, the resurrection of the just happens in three stages. This is where I got confused. The resurrection of the just happens in three stages. I'll let you soak that in while I clear my throat. <clears throat> Initially, Jesus is going to return for his church at what time, church? The rapture. At the rapture, you say, well, I've heard a hundred people tell me. I've heard a hundred people tell me that there's no such mention of the rapture. Let's stop using the term then. Jesus is going to return for his people at the harpazo. That's the Greek that's used. You'll throw it out there, they'll go, like that. That's fine. That's exactly what tells us is going to happen. He's going to return for his people at the rapture. Who is he going to return for? Well, at the time of Pentecost. This is right after Jesus had arisen from the dead and right after he ascended into heaven. We had Pentecost and the Holy Spirit came down. That was the beginning of what we know as the church age. It started right then and it's been going ever since then through today until the end of the church day, uh, church age whenever the Lord concludes it. But at the end of that time, which could be right now, which could be in this service, the rapture could happen. And the Lord could take us home. Paul wrote about it in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. He said, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. During that time, the rapture is going to happen. The Lord is going to take the church up with him. He's going to prepare us, get this, to meet the rest of our family in a completed state, or a good chunk of them at least. The second stage, and all this is right here in Scripture, the second stage of the resurrection will happen at the end of the tribulation. It's going to happen at the end of the tribulation. Let's do this together because I don't want you to get lost. What event could happen at any moment right now? The rapture. Okay, so the rapture happens. There are seven years. At the end of that terrible, terrible time, Jesus is going to come back. Now, when Jesus comes back, he's going to raise to life all the people that have died during that seven years in his name. How do I know this? Well, if you look back at Revelation chapter 6, verse 9, it tells you that there were people crying out from under the altar. Those were the people that had been martyred or killed during that tribulation period. So you've got the church with resurrected bodies, and then you've got souls crying out from under the altar who don't have the body yet. When Jesus comes back at the end of the tribulation, he is going to fit them with their glorified bodies. But it's not going to be just them. He's also going to give Old Testament saints... They're glorified bodies. Oh, wait a second, Pastor. You said the rapture could happen and we could get glorified bodies. Why don't the Old Testament saints get them right there at that point when Jesus comes back? I'll tell you why. Because Jesus comes back for who at the rapture? The church. The bride of Christ. They don't have the... Now, there are some of them that have already received them. A few. We know about this because it tells us in Matthew 27, 52, that the tomb split open, that the earth was shaking, and we had saints walking around Israel during that time, and the people just recognized them. I'm betting that in your glorified body, you're going to stick out a little bit. Okay? So at that time, at the second coming of Christ, after the seven years is over, 
we're going to receive our glorified bodies if you were in the tribulation. And the Old Testament saints will get them as well. The third stage, the third stage of the resurrection that is going to take place during the millennium. That's the thousand year reign of Christ. That's the third stage of resurrections that's going to take place. All of the church, all of the Old Testament saints are with the Lord here on earth and he's reigning for a thousand years. There are people that at the beginning believed in the Lord and they'll enter into that thousand years with him. When they enter in, during that time, they will age. They don't have glorified bodies. This is a group of people. Not everybody had received a glorified body at the second coming of Christ. So they'll have kids and they'll live and they'll age. And unless there's a terrible, terrible accident, which would be difficult during this time, eventually they're going to die. Okay? They're going to die. Here's what I think is going to happen, and I'll use scripture to back this up. I believe when those people die during the millennium, they will immediately be given a glorified body. At the instant that they die, boom, it's just going to hit them. Now, there's some people that will put that at the end of the millennial reign of Christ. I believe it happens absolutely immediately at that point. Do you remember when Jesus was talking to Martha about Lazarus, what he said? This comes from John 11, 25 and 26. He said, I am, it's one of those I am statements, I am the resurrection and the what? He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? He said later on in that same book, in John chapter 14, he said, I go to prepare a place that where I am, the Lord speaking, there you may be also. So when those people die during that thousand years and the Lord is there with them, when they die in this flesh suit, when they lay off this tent, as Peter said and Paul said, when this time is up for this old body, you will immediately be fitted with a glorified body next to our Lord and Savior. That's a great time coming. This is the third one. Those were the three stages of the resurrection of the just. Then there is the resurrection of the unjust. Now I'm going to read to you where we started. This is that order in 1 Corinthians 15. It says, Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. At the end of time, When time stops, there is no more. According to 2 Peter, with a fervent heat, God is going to incinerate the entire universe. And at the moment when that happens, the saints with Jesus Christ will stand there and a judgment will take place known as the great white throne judgment. This is a terrifying thing because you've got the just on one side and the unjust on the other side. And he has resurrected them to death. Not to life. He's the life. He's resurrected those people to death. And they're, hand, they're hanging in the expanse and the void of nothingness. And that's when they will be judged. He resurrected bodies from all over the planet in the sea and brings them to that one appointed time where everything that they've ever done against our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be flashed before them. They will understand where they've stood against them and with weeping and gnashing of teeth, angry over what he's about to do to them, not sad, not crying that they missed their opportunity, he is going to cast them into the lake of fire. Where is this talked about? Here's the verse that goes with it. Daniel chapter 12 verse 2. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake. These to everlasting life, remember this is not 
talking about a sequence. There's some to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Those are the three resurrections that are talked about in Scripture. I realize as I go through this on a Sunday morning, it's certainly a lot to understand, a lot to take in, because it was for me as I prepared it. But I want to tell you why I did. I want to tell you why I went through this for you. I was born into a loving family that always gave me more than I needed. I I never have gone into a place, area, stage of my life where I was in want. Hasn't happened. Born with a heart defect, my parents took me to the hospital for years. And I got surgeries. They flipped the bill on things. I got that attention that I needed during that time. I lived in a loving Christian home where they watched over us. They uh, provided for our school needs as best they could when they were coming up. For some crazy reason, somebody, somebody that was born with severe learning disabilities and did not have the parents that allowed him to use it as an excuse got through college and seminary. I finished all of that time. And when that time was over, I could do nothing more than thank God for what he's done in my life, for the things going on there. My parents gave me a lot, but all of that is trivial compared to what you have waiting on you in Christ Jesus. He has given us infinitely more than anything we'll ever have in our life. All the blessings that you have stacked up next to each other do not compare to that which Christ Jesus has waiting on you if you've given your life to Him. And we're not talking about a one-time event. This is why I went through those examples early in the sermon. Because I want you to understand, when you give your life to Him, it's completely given to Him and doing His work no matter what stage in life you're in. People cannot understand. You, You cannot understand what it is to live a life for Christ if you live a life of selfishness and stinginess with your time. Mainly in this American uh, population that surround us, that's where we get affected the most. We don't want to give up our time. Not going to do it. Folks, God gave everything through His Son, Jesus Christ, that you might be saved. Can you sacrifice a little bit for Him? If you don't, if you won't, then you don't understand what He did. I'm not saying that you give up every hour, every waking minute where, where you're living to do things that you don't want to do. In, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, God gave us all things to enjoy. Okay? So I hear you on that. But if you're part of the church, if you're part of the kingdom of God, generosity is in your DNA. It has to be. You, you're going to give Because He is the life source. He's the reason that you're living now and you're going to live throughout eternity. He gave His most precious gift through His Son that never did one thing wrong, not one time in all of eternity. He gave Him up so that we might have life. So that when God the Father looks at you, He looks on a person who imbibes the Lord Jesus Christ. We are the very reflection of the Son. And I believe if we're Christians, then we're going to show up and we're going to be merciful. Amen? We're going to be a merciful people. We're going to be humble. I believe that's going to be a part of who we are. I believe we're going to be generous. And I'll skip ahead to next week. I believe that we're willing. I believe all those things go together. If you're a part of the family of God, if you're in here today, those are things that naturally happen. That's not asking too much. And I may be speaking broadly, but you know where it applies in your own life. Think about Him who gave everything for you that you might have life after this body fails. 
For some of you, you say, I know Jesus Christ. He is my Lord and Savior. But I've slipped back. I've, I've been selfish with my time, my money, and my strength. I haven't been doing the work of the Lord the way that he set it up. All you got to do is tell him what he already knows. Say, God, here it is. Here's what I've been doing. For those of you that don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, here was the plan to be saved. He said that you needed to repent of your sins. That means turn from your sin, your life, your attitude, and your goals. Turn off of yourself and the world, and they're aimed at him for the first time. You repent of your sins, and you put your faith and trust in him that when this body stops, when it ceases to breathe anymore, he will save you eternally. That's what it takes to be saved. That's what the scriptures tell us, the apostles repeated. And if you're one of those people today that's hearing me talk and you haven't given your life over to the Lord, humble yourself before him, ask him to do it, and he'll save you. Okay? If you would please stand. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for the time that you've given us to come together and worship you. And Lord, I don't know where this message hit people. But I pray that you would use whatever was of you. Father, that you would take it and you would just apply it where it needs to be applied and it would be dropped off where it doesn't need to be. Lord, there's a lot of people that gather with the church that may not be a part of it. Father, I pray that they're convicted and they come to know you. And Father, I pray that we would rejoice, that we would join our hearts together in thanking you and praising you for what you've done through your son. And because of that, we would be giving with our own lives. Lord, thank you for everything that you're done, are doing, or will do. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.